So we should talk about uh, properties of differentiation, rules of differentiation. Okay, so let's list what they are and maybe prove a couple. So maybe the most basic one is the sum rule. It's so obvious, it shouldn't really be mentioned. It's almost a distraction. So I'll put the parameter. So this one goes almost without saying, and if I wanted to prove it, uh, it's so obvious we wouldn't even know where to start. And I think it would be a distraction and just a formal exercise. So we'll skip this one as far as proving is concerned. So another one is if a function is multiplied by a constant, uh, then you know exactly what it is. So then come the interesting ones. And one of them is the product rule. If you multiply by a scalar function, that's also a function of t, and you differentiate the product, then the derivative is exactly what you would expect. Okay. Of course, the most interesting one is the product rule with respect to the dot product. This one is not at all obvious. Like I think, well, this one's not obvious either. They're equally not obvious, but this one I'll prove. I planned on saving it for your homework, but this is such an appealing proof that, I'll, that I can't resist. And once again, it's exactly what you would expect. So, u prime v times u v prime. Exactly how you would expect a product to work. And the final one uh, that I will also, I'll prove this one because I can't resist doing it. And for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. So the one remaining one is the chain rule. If you have u of f of t, and you're taking the derivative of it, that's a lot of parentheses. I'm not a fan of parentheses, but what are you going to do here? That it's going to be u prime evaluated at f of t times the derivative of f of t. So that's the chain rule. So the only thing that's interesting to, that's interesting to me about this one is if you hear chain rule, you might momentarily imagine something like this. So the taxonomy is the challenge, how things fit together and fold into each other. And this is a perfect way to construct a vector-valued function over real argument. And this is nothing. There's no such thing as a function of a vector argument. Because if there was, you can contrive something like this, but we wouldn't be able to take a derivative of it. So just let's think that through very quickly. If we had something like this, can you contrive something like this? Yes, you absolutely can. It's a black box where a vector goes in and another vector comes out. Sure, I could contrive a function like this. But you couldn't take a derivative of it, because if you recall what the derivative entails is uh, making an increment. Okay, maybe I can think of a vector increment. Uh, maybe I could think of something like that. Subtracting u of v plus the increment minus u of v, and then dividing by the increment. But you cannot divide by a vector. That increment would be a vector-valued object, and you cannot divide by a vector. So that algebraic approach to the, der to the derivative uh, will uh, break down. So if you want to go down this route, you have to be creative and think outside the box and think of it as a, the derivative of something like this as a new sort of operator. And of course, people have done it and they say that it's a linear transformation that has certain properties and so on. But I'm a fan of having, number one, fewer objects rather than more fewer operations rather than more, fewer elementary things that you start out with rather than more. I like Lego pieces. I like having very simple pieces and then building uh, a big framework 
from a small number of pieces. And finally, what do I not like? I like, I don't like introducing objects unless there is a need for them, a need generated by some other greater motivation. So I wouldn't just idly start defining like this because I feel like math is not complete without it. Okay, so <laughs> before I cross it out, before I erase it, as far as I'm concerned, there is no such thing as a function of a vector argument because you couldn't take a derivative of it. it could, there is even no such thing as a scalar valued function of a vector argument, right? It's just not something that I've personally needed in my analysis, right? Things naturally depend on numerical parameters like this. So I hope this, this is helpful because when I learn subjects, new subjects, it's once again the word, I like the word taxonomy. Taxonomy is how do things fit together and what's their hierarchy and how can they be combined? I use the word taxonomy to, to define that. And just keeping that clear uh, is very important. And also saying to yourself, okay, that's a vector. This is a number. So we have a number plus a number. So this plus sign, you know, we use the same sign for adding vectors and adding numbers. So which one is this? So my brain, the way it works, it tells me, okay, this is plus. This is the addition of numbers. This is the addition of numbers. This is multiplication of a scalar by a vector. Yes, that's one of the operations. This is obviously the dot product of two vectors. This is a number. This is a number. Does that make sense? You know, I'm, all, I'm constantly talking to myself and naming what I'm looking at. You know, this is a function of a real argument, which is this. And this is just an ordinary function, just like you encountered in calculus. It's a real function of a real argument, and so on. Okay, so let's prove this one. And the reason why I want to prove it is because I know what you're thinking. And, and I've been trying to detox you from that way of thinking and really adopt the way of thinking where vectors are treated on their own terms as geometric objects. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that you I'll write it shorthand, I'll drop the functional argument, that u dot v is something like u1 v1 plus u2 v2, that's in two dimensions, so there's no u3 v3. And if I had to take the, a derivative of this, now everything's a function of t. Then I basically have to take a derivative of this, which means that it's the derivative of this plus the derivative of this, and these are just numbers, so it's just u prime, I will combine this with this, and this is u, and this is u prime dotted with v, plus this combined with this is u dotted with v prime qed. Am I right? That that's, that's what you're thinking, you're just, you've just been trained to go straight to components and straight to coordinates and straight to numbers and leave geometry behind as quickly as possible. And I understand why that happens. It's a very, in some ways, a very robust approach. To be honest, it's a very robust approach for high school calculus problems. And then it's completely inept beyond that, beyond that. So what's wrong with this as I'm erasing it? What's wrong with this is that it's not treating vectors on their own terms, right? It's, it's as if a Cartesian coordinate system or some other coordinate system, well, the way we express the dot product, it was a Cartesian coordinate system, uh, was introduced in the background and we were just working with components and uh, as if to say that vectors are too confusing to be working with directly uh, according to the few rules that they satisfy. But it's not, they're, they're plenty enough. So let's prove it. And of course, this is not original at all. It mimics the proof from ordinary calculus. And what the only thing to realize is that the proof from ordinary calculus can be adapted to work with vectors. Right? It's funny, you always have to think it through. So you can't have a function of a vector argument because as you begin to think it through, you realize that, oh, I would have to divide by a vector, so it's not really working. So 
a priori, you don't know if it's going to work out or not. But this one, this one works out. I'll just introduce a function f of t. I think that's helpful. That's u of t dotted with v of t. Okay? And the derivative of f of t, just so that you see the, the overall framework, is defined as the limit. That's the definition. And the only reason why I introduced this function and wrote this, just so that when I'm about to write a more complex expression, you see that it's basically this structure. So we have Okay, and I actually remember when I was studying calculus and first trying to prove the product rule by myself via limits. I got to this and I had no idea what to do with it. Just no idea, because you can't factor anything, right? There is just ah, nothing you can do with this expression. So you do a very, very creative thing and you add and subtract the same term. And that term is, I'm just going to say that it's u times t plus h dotted with v. So I'm adding it, and I'm sub v of t. See, that's nice. So u ha is evaluated at t plus h, but v is evaluated at t. So you throw in this mixed term, and then you subtract it so that you have actually made no difference. So I've left it unaltered because I added and subtracted the same term. But now look, now I can actually factor things. Here, I will combine these two terms and factor out u evaluated at t plus h. And here I will factor out v evaluated at t. So I gave myself something that I can now factor. So here's what I have. Uh, plus, I'll just double up the limit, as was suggested. Okay. And actually, what I really want to divide by h is just this difference. And here, it's just this difference. So now, as we take this limit, let's observe that this difference divided by h is v prime. This, as h goes to 0, is just u of t. Right? And of course, if I thought of about it just a moment longer, I would have, oh, I'm missing the right verb, but I would have designed this proof so that u prime v shows up first and u v prime shows up second, right? So, but I didn't practice this, so I have u v prime showing up first and u prime v showing up second. So, this limit approaches QED, right? It's, it's very, very nice. There is nothing creative about this. This is the proof you would find in any ordinary calculus textbook. The interesting observation is that it survives vectors. And so I'm hoping that you are becoming freer and freer of the coordinate way of thinking. These objects are perfectly capable of being worked with on their own terms. All right? So that's the proof. So these are our rules of differentiation. So now we're going to do a couple of problems where we use them.